I suggest we get started. Um, to many here today, uh, Hans doesn't really need an introduction. Uh, for us here at Roslyn, some of, some of, some of us know uh, Hans when he was doing his PhD with John Williams. Hans, it's great to have you back here today, uh, even if only in the virtual format. We really appreciate that you, you know, that you're joining us on your Australian evening. Um, back to the introduction. So since uh, his stay at Roslyn, Hans went really just you know, onwards and upwards. Today, Hans holds uh, a joint appointment at the Victorian state government, where he's a research leader, and La Trobe University, where he's a professor. Hans leads a group of 30 scientists and students that work in quantitative genetics and data analysis. Today, Hans will summarize the last 10 years of the Thousand Bulls Genomes Project. Um, but before he starts, I would like to add that he will be available for the ad hoc meeting at the end. Hans, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Um, I'm been looking at the people joining and uh, many, many names uh, are very familiar from my time at Rosslyn. Um, so it's, it's a, sort of a special way, I guess, to uh, talk to you again today. So yeah, today I'll talk about the, the 10 years of the Thousand Bull Genomes Project. So hard to believe, but yes, it is already 10 years. And we've had two five-year phases of the project. And I, I'd like to summarize uh, in some small way, I guess, the impact it has had on cattle breeding over time. So, yeah, I guess most people know where Australia is, but uh, I'm not so sure whether people know where, where we are located. So we're in Melbourne, um, just out in a suburb outside of Melbourne, uh, in a building called AgriBio, which is actually on the La Trobe University campus. And AgriBio is a joint venture between Agriculture Victoria, which is the state research, agricultural research uh, institute, and uh, La Trobe University. Um, the Agriculture Victoria Research Division, which I'm part of, has about 500 staff, about 80 students, and 14 locations across the state of Victoria. And we really work in multidisciplinary teams. Um, so even though I'm a quantitative geneticist, I, I work with all sorts of people from all sorts of different backgrounds. So um, that's really the way we operate. And uh, so our location, this location is, a, is about here on the map on, in the south end of, the, of, in, in, of Australia there. So um, there are six sort of science branches in Agriculture Victoria. And I'm part of this one here. And computational biology is uh, the group I lead together with, with Jenny Price. So let's think back to 2010, or roughly 2010. What did we actually know about sequence data? And actually, we didn't know very much about sequence data. We had some theories. Uh, the Thousand Human uh, Genome Project had been launched in 2008, so a couple of years prior. And at the time, 2010 or so, there's probably less than a handful of bulls that had been sequenced. But what about imputation of sequence? What would sequence actually add to breeding? All these were open questions uh, that were left to be explored. We had, of course, genotyping technology at that time. Uh, we had a couple of iterations of a bovine reference assembly uh, you know, that had been published. We the bovine hat map paper had been published, and SNP chips were basically the state of the art. So uh, heavy use of the 50K, standard 50K SNP chip, um, and also development of the bovine HD SNP chip around that time too. And these were really um, based on having neutral markers, as in not really markers that we knew that did anything, but basically just neutral markers equally spaced across the genome. And they relied heavily on linkage disequilibrium uh, to pick up or uh, be associated with QTL. And then we could either do genomic selection or we could do mapping exercises. Of course, there's limitations for fine mapping with uh, 50,000 SNPs um, and also for causal variant discovery, there's limitations. And there were theories about limitations for genomic predictions. 
whole genome sequence, in contrast, um, has all the variants in, in the genome present in it, uh, as long as they're, um, you know, discoverable, I guess, with the technology we're using for sequencing. And usually, in, by and large, people have been using short read sequencing uh, to, um, to do this. So we are looking at about 100 to 150 base pairs in length for a single read. And these reads are then aligned to reference genome, uh, basically finding a location of the genome where uh, it best fits to the reference genome. And we can generate a, a varying amount of data per sample, which um, is the usual metric is essentially how many reads on average are aligned for a position on the genome. So if it's 10 reads on average, then we call that tenfold coverage. And most projects would probably sequence between 6 and 30x coverage. Now, a lot of these loci are monomorphic, and so out of the 3 billion, we actually pull out a few million that are actually varying across the animals that we're actually interested in. So back to 2010 then, uh, what were some sequence hypotheses we had? Well, we thought all the causative mutations were present, if there, at least if they were SNP or NINDEL. Um, we, we had some hypotheses about the ability to impute and that that should be possible. There have been, of course, papers on imputation, mostly in human data. Um, some imputation had been carried out on SNP chip data to some extent in 2010, of course. Uh, and then we, would all, we also had sort of theories about easier discovery of causative mutations. Well, first of all, we would have them in the sequence data, so how could it not be easy? Um, and also, we thought it could increase genomic prediction accuracy because we would be less reliant on linkage disequilibrium between markers and, and QTL. I'm being a bit flippant with these hypotheses. I mean, they were not bad hypotheses, and some of them are in part true, uh, but you know, possibly we were slightly maybe hadn't uh, looked at all the angles. But the big problem was that we um, it was just too costly for individual groups to investigate this on their own. So this really brings us to the start of the Thousand Bull Genomes Project. And I guess an early sort of call for international collaboration in this area was made by Mike Goddard in 2007 at the Animal Genomics for Animal Health uh, Conference in Paris, where he had a proposal for in silico sequencing of key ancestors or of using key ancestors, um, which essentially in today's language is imputation. And um, so I'm not saying other people didn't have similar ideas. This is what I'm aware of. So, you know, I, I don't want to start a war of who said what first, but, you know, I'm aware of this one. And why do key ancestors work? Well, in Holsteins for certainly and many other species, uh, livestock species, we have, have, of course, low effective population size, and we have key ancestors that occur over and over and over again in our pedigrees. For example, Erlinda chief is um, roughly 10% of the haplotypes in the current bulls in Australia trace back to Erlinda chief, and pretty much every pedigree in, Aust in, in Canada has Hanaberil starbuck in it. In it. So, there's certainly these key ancestors in, in you know, our major cattle breeds. If we sequence them, uh, we, we should cover a lot of the genetic diversity. So Ben Hayes and uh, the Congress in 2010 in Leipzig uh, proposed, floated, uh, if you will, a consortium idea and uh, formalized this in 2011 at the Sir Mark Oliphant Genomics Conference in, in Melbourne where key collaborators uh, attended. And uh, that was really the foundation of the Thousand Bull Genomes Project. So Ben, along with a few others, uh, decided to collaborate and share data. <laughs> so um, I guess why, just a little bit more of, about why we want the Thousand Bull Genomes Project. Sequencing was very expensive in 2011, so thousands of dollars per sample. Um, and it's still more expensive now than SNP chips, of course. So we're talking, this is 
sort of Australian dollars, uh, 600 uh, for 10x or so, probably less than that now. And a 50K SNP chip is about 30 bucks. Um, again, prices vary, but it's still cheap, more expensive than a SNP chip. So what did we, what's the strategy? Well, it's the strategy was to sequence key ancestors and impute genotypes in silico sequence, if you will, from sequenced animals into ad all animals that have been genotyped with the SNP chip. But that requires a global database of sequence. And that's what the Thousand Bulls project was sort of tasked to provide. So, so it provides a database of sequenced cattle, uh, of Taurus, Indicus, and other boss species backgrounds. It's a global collaboration, so that generates economies of scale. Um, and it, that maximizes SNP discovery and eventually through increases in data set size, imputation accuracy. And the general model of the project was that people had to put in uh, a certain amount of sequences and they got all the sequences back from the whole project. So in many ways, it was a very good deal for, uh, for people to get into sequence data without having to send huge amounts of money, which would have really been cost prohibitive for many groups. So the project is organized like this. So we have uh, over 40 partner institutions globally. So the red dots are the different places or collaborators, partner institutions that we have. And we're, we're represented in more than 20 countries. And in the project, we um, agreed to a set of uh, sequence processing guidelines. Um, in, a set, in essence, they are the GATK best practices. Um, for, for, you know, quality control and, uh, you know, processing of raw sequence. Um, and partners might provide raw data to us, as in FASTQ files, or they might do the processing themselves and provide uh, BAM files and GBCS to us in Agriculture Victoria. And then there's a whole other stream, which is actually the public data that's in the sequence read archives, which here at Agriculture Victoria or in collab previously for run eight, seven and eight, um, with collaboration with Bob Schnabel at University of Missouri, uh, we downloaded the, all the public data that was available, processed it in the same way uh, as all the other data in the project, and put that also into the project. <clears throat> so really it's public and uh, private data that goes into the project. So once we receive all these BAM files and GBCFs uh, in, in Agriculture Victoria in Melbourne. We do quality control. We sort of look at, you know, does it conform to our standards? Uh, we check the metadata very carefully of the public data. There's actually quite a big job in sorting out duplicates, uh, especially uh, in the public data. Sometimes individuals or animals have been submitted twice into public archives. Sometimes um, animals have been provided to us by partners and have been made public, so we need to just make sure we don't have animals in there multiple times. And we need to confirm subspecies because uh, we can't always trust the metadata to say the right species. <laughs> so we confirm subspecies actually with a partial least square discriminatory analysis uh, that we've run in house. <clears throat> so once we have the, all the data together, we then do variant calling and again, and genotype calling, and we do that with GATK, uh, then a variant calibration step in QC. And then once that's done, then we release files back to the, these partners um, that are in the project uh, as raw VCFs, so raw VCFs that have been variant calibrated. And then we also do um, a set of VCFs in the Taurus animals that are run through Beagle, so we fill in the missing data uh, the missing genotypes in, uh, and, and provide that to the, to the partners. The raw VCFs of the public animals, we actually, for run eight, they have been deposited in, in the European Variation Archive. So they are available under this uh, project number there. <clears throat> so we have 
there's a good number of the individuals in the project that are actually public. So the project has grown quite a lot over time. Uh, you know, initially one thought a thousand was a large number and jolly would we ever get to it. But now we actually are at a point we have where we have six and a half thousand animals in the project. Um, in the tour, we have three different data sets in run nine, which is the latest run. Um, so we have the Taurus data set, which is sort of European type cattle that's around 5,000 animals. Then we have a Taurus indicus combined. So that's uh, including the indicus and Taurus indicus uh, composites and crosses. Um, that's about 6,000 animals. And most of them of these are actually male, uh, of course, because most it's generally males get sequenced more. Um, so that's still the case. Um, it's probably even a higher number than this, but for some, we don't know whether they're male and female, especially with the public data. And we haven't actually gone as far as confirming sex for each individual animal. We could, of course, because we, we know which chromosomes they have. We could see which chromosomes they have. But um, so we also have um, out, an outspecies run, we call it, um, which essentially contains all the weird and wonderful things other boss species, so yak, gar, bison, bentang, gaiao, and probably a couple of other things. And there's about 430 of those uh, in, in run nine. <clears throat> so here we see on, the, on this graph here, we see the sort of the increase in diversity over time. So we have from, and this is Taurus, uh, from very few breeds, I think four were now you know, over 150 breed groups. Um, it's not, they're not all purebreds. So there's different types of crosses that are counted as, as a different breed group. Um, and we've had, uh, of course, as we had more animals and more breeds, we've had an increase in the variants that were discovered, of course. Um, now there's a, been a big jump here from between uh, run six and seven. And that's when we switched from SAM tools to GATK. Um, so there's two, two changes there. We changed to a completely different pipeline of, for variant calling. And we changed to the new reference genome, of course. So we changed to ARS uh, UCD 1.2 at that time, too. So there's been, that's why there's this sort of uh, quite a large increase there. <clears throat> Uh, when we look at Taurus index combined, you know, it's the same trend, really, uh, quite a large increase in the number of breed groups and increase in the, you know, the variants discovered. <clears throat> Interestingly, uh, with the outspecies, uh, even though there's only 400 animals, because we are looking at different subspecies or different species of boss uh, animals, um, there's a lot of variants that get discovered in this run, over 120 million, which is, you know, equivalent to or more than actually in the Taurus themselves, which it's not that surprising because we're looking at a lot of these SNPs and variants would be species differences between these different boss species. So a bit more on breed composition. <clears throat> um, so 250 breed groups over here, you can sort of see a breakdown of uh, what they are. So Holstein, of course, is the biggest one, 20 percent. That's about 1,200 or so animals. Uh, Angus is the next big one. And, uh, you know, this is a big group, but actually it's, I call this Euro small, but it c contains lots of small breeds in Europe. So we actually have a really good uh, coverage of lots of native um, heritage sort of breeds uh, of Europe now. And, uh, you know, then there's all these other ones that, you know, made the sort of one to 2% cutoff to make the figure not completely messy. Uh, we also have quite a lot of African breeds. I think we could use more, of course, of uh, the developing regions, uh, breeds from the developing regions. And in particular, we could be using, uh, we could do with a bit more indicus from developing regions. And finally, we don't really have a huge amount of uh, animals from South America at this time. So 
In the remaining time, I'd like to go into some of the applications of this thousand whole genomes data. Um, there's sort of five major areas where I see the, the project has having had an impact. And one is of, on um, imputation, I guess, to for giving, providing a data set to investigate imputation and come up with strategies for imputation of sequence, and now to routine um, application, really, of se sequence imputation in, in many partner institutions. Um, also, population diversity. Um, and uh, this is a, a really probably the, one of the biggest uh, applications of whole genome sequence data from the thousand bulls is the search for causative mutations, both for sort of deleterious monoge monogenic variants, uh, but also for quantitative traits. Um, it has helped integrate data sets together, uh, where previously that was more difficult. Um, and also for genomic prediction accuracy, there's been a good amount of activity of investigating the use of sequence data for uh, genomic prediction accuracy or what it would do. <clears throat> so imputation, um, I don't think I need to do a, a big spiel about imputation, about how it works, but basically, and this is a very simplified schema, of course, um, we have a reference individual, and if we have an individual that's genotyped with a SNP chip at just at certain spots, essentially we just need to match up the alleles, um, and then we can fill in the, the bases in between uh, to get full sequence data, at least assuming a recombination between these two loci here. Um, this works reasonably well, or remarkably well in some cases, but of course has some errors. So this is a imputation error, and the trick is to minimize these errors, I suppose. So what affects imputation accuracy? Well, the number of animals that we have in our reference, you know, the bigger the better. Um, minor allele frequency of the variant, the relationship of the reference animals and the to-be-imputed individuals, closer relationships tend to work better. Um, and there's some algorithms that require close relationships and some that cope better with more population samples. Um, the quality of the sequence data, uh, well, how deeply was it sequenced? Uh, what's the quality control that was put over top of it? And then, well, how sparse is the, dense, the, the lower density platform to the, to the sequence data? Well, how big is the jump from low to high density? Now, the project really can make an impact in these, this part here, um, and probably less so down here. This is really sort of meant to demonstrate how far we've come with imputation over time. So back in run three, we had 429 animals in our reference, uh, or in the project that we released. So this is only Taurus. And, um, you know, this was the accuracy we could achieve for imputation, and that's a minor layer frequency on the x-axis down here, and then the accuracy of imputation on the y. And, you know, we all, it's a, we all know this now, but uh, this was something to be found out, that the, the lower frequency variants, we just didn't impute very well uh, at the time, and that's just basically because you don't see them enough to be confident in, you know, to have any power in imputation. Um, so as we went from 400 or so animals to 1,500 or 1,600 in run five, you know, these started to lift up, you know, where these lower end of the frequency spectrum, you know, we could risk increase the imputation accuracy there. And again, for run eight, now we are more than 4,000 animals, you know, we're seeing quite a large impact of where these minor allele frequency variants at the lower end of the scale here are imputed much better. And of course, you know, we, in the sequence data, 50% of the variants are actually less than 0.1 minor real frequency. So it's, it's a quite a large proportion of the data that now over time, we've been able to impute uh, much better. And that's by and large, one of the big legacies, I think, of the Thousand Bull Genomes Project that, you know, people have banded together, we've shared data, and we have a really large data set to improve 
uh, imputation accuracies. So what have been some of the main learnings from this? So we have learned that large reference samples were required. I mean, that's not too much of a surprise, but uh, it certainly has demonstrated that that's a major, uh, an important part to get good imputation accuracy for low frequency variants. Um, we found that multi-breed reference samples were useful. This is an effect that's quite minor in the larger breeds, when I mean larger as in uh, individuals with lots of sequence data or uh, breeds with lots of sequence data. But it does help, certainly leads to improvements in the small breeds where sequence data is limited. Uh, Multi-step imputation in general has been useful. Um, so that's going from low, medium to high to sequence. Um, <clears throat> is, I, I think it's clear that that's the best strategy. Uh, but it does require that each of these steps, we have enough individual sequence. We can't, you know, if we have a bottleneck in one of, one of these platforms, then this strategy is not going to work that well. Um, I think it's also clear that filtering variance on imputation accuracy is, a, is of some use for downstream application. There's no point in taking forward variants that are imputed badly. And um, the also the use of dosage genotypes in GWAS uh, can reduce false positives. So, because it accounts for uncertainty. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, um, so that's, I guess, another sort of outcome from from looking at uh, imputed data in, in GWAS from the thousand goals. So, in terms of diversity in population genetics. Um, probably not as much activity in this area than, than others, potentially from the thousand bulls. But, you know, there have been papers that have looked at diversity of between breeds, uh, cross breeds, uh, selection signatures, some evolutionary questions, ancestral alleles have been called, um, and people have looked at nuclear and maternal diversity. And in terms of nuclear diversity, there's this uh, paper from Nick Bowman um, from a couple of years ago where they looked at uh, selection signatures in areas of uh, genes with really large effects that came up in this uh, meta was uh, for stature that uh, was done. Uh, for in terms of mitochondrial diversity, I've ha we've had a PhD student at Agriculture Victoria, Jimmy Dorji, that has looked at that, and um, we've in the end. From run eight, we used about 1,800 or so animals. We filtered very strongly. Um, and that was required because a lot of the samples were actually from semen. So what you find is from semen is that uh, if you look at mitochondria, you can actually get quite a bit of heteroplasmy uh, showing up. So it's, quite, it's really important to filter properly. And I think we've filtered properly. So what I'm showing you, I think, is fair to show. Uh, <clears throat> so we, we did call the haplogroups with mito tools in, the, in these animals here, and we also clustered them with uh, nuclear techniques. But so this is sort of the mitochondrial breakdown of Indicus and Taurus cattle. And if you look into the clusters here, you can sort of make out the different haplogroups. Um, and if you look over on this side, on the right hand side, we have uh, basically a network of uh, haplotypes that we find in Holstein. And uh, they're primarily T3, which is sort of European type cattle. Um, but uh, interestingly, there's actually some T1s, which is African, and there's even some Indicus, so maternally Indicus uh, Holsteins. These are actually from Australia, both all of these animals. A uh, couple of these Indicus are from China. So that's evidence of grading up. Uh, you know, T1 or Indicus type cattle with, with Holstein uh, semen, I suppose. And I guess my, our takeaway from this sort of picture here is that uh, there seems to be enough diversity within Holstein mitochondria uh, to do some sort of Chivas type analysis um, to sort of look at the impact of mitochondrial variants on some phenotypic traits. We did look at imputation, um, and we did find that uh, the imputation accuracy for homoplasmic loci uh, is, is more than 99%. So 
So on to the search for causative mutations. So there's really two things here. There's uh, the monogenic traits and the quantitative traits. In the monogenic traits, generally people look at family designs of affected versus unaffected individuals. Uh, they might do GWAS if they have enough of a, uh, enough of a population sample. And the major contribution here of the Thousand Bull project is that it provides uh, really a large number of control animals uh, to narrow the list of candidate loci. So people generally look at uh, some of these uh, monogenic things within breed. Uh, and then the assumption is that it doesn't really occur, the syndrome or whatever they're looking at, doesn't really occur in other breeds. So then other breeds become a control. So we want uh, a variant that's uh, segregating within the breed you're looking at, but not so much in the other, other breeds. And for quantitative traits, uh, essentially the tool of choice has been genome-wide association studies. And here the major contribution of the thousand bulls is that, uh, that it provides this large reference for imputation that I've already discussed. So just as an example uh, for how would one sort of look at find something that uh, seems to be monogenic. Um, curly hair and fleck fee, this is, uh, was published in, in our paper from 2014. Uh, it was work done by uh, Hubert Pausch and Rudy Fries. So first they did a, a sequence GWAS um, proportion curly coat uh, in, in bulls, uh, as in uh, the daughters of bulls. And uh, the two regions really came up very significant, uh, one on BTA19 and one on BTA5. And the BTA19 had really highly significant p-values. They then filtered for variants that were not in, in other 1,000 bulls breeds, and about five of them came up. And then within those five, they found a missense mutation in KRT27, which actually also seemed to cause a very similar uh, sort of syndrome of wavy coat in mice. So, it's pretty close to a causal variance, I would say. <clears throat> so that's basically, so it's this part here where the thousand bulls uh, really comes in. And if you sort of look at a list, so this is, I'm not sure if it's complete, but the, as far as I know, this is all the monogenic variants that have used the thousand bulls project to, um, to narrow down the list of candidate variants. Um, and, you know, there's quite a lot of, uh, you have the embryonic lethals that are, you know, segregating in various species uh, that have quite an impact, I guess, on, on profitability and, and on farm uh, that we now can handle much more accurately by having actual causative, causative variant, variant uh, for Holstein, Fleck uh, even Mobiliard uh, and others. So a major contribution from the project uh, towards identifying these. <clears throat> At the quantitative level, uh, sequence level GWAS have been carried out for pretty much every trait I can think of in cattle. Um, in general, people have used the thousand bull genomes data to impute. Um, and there's been many, many publications and there's just way too many to actually list so I'm not going to because I don't have enough time. There's also been uh, work done on looking for pleiotropic loci and also uh, activity uh, that sort of seems to be gathering steam a bit on looking at uh, meta-analysis of GWAS uh, at, at the sequence level. And it's this last part I'll spend a couple of slides on. <clears throat> so, uh, this is a, a Nick's paper again. So a Nick led uh, the analysis, a meta-analysis for stature in more than 50,000 animals from 14 countries. And this is the Manhattan plot of that. So, you know, some of the, you know, some of the key genes that some of them were known, of course, before, and they are essentially confirmed again, but it also discovered new, new regions that, uh, uh, were important for stature, uh, just because of the massive power this data set had. 
So when on the right hand side, maybe first, so we have the different breeds that were represented and from the different countries. And they explained uh, between uh, about 0.2 to about 14% of the phenotypic variation. So the lead SNP, so there's 163 lead SNP from, from that meta-analysis explained uh, the up to 14% of the genetic ver phenotypic variation. And when the, we did the, or when Anik did the prediction um, using the 163 lead SNPs into different uh, validation animals. So we had Angus, Hereford, and Belted Galloway. Um, and in each of these breed groups, what was interesting was that we had standard sort of type Angus, Hereford, and Galloway. And then we had miniature type cattle. Uh, which are just short statured. Uh, they're not dwarfs, they're short statured. Um, and the prediction from the 163 lead SNPs could accurately dissect that the standard cattle were, you know, generally, you know, a reasonable amount taller than, than these miniature individuals. So even though it didn't really explain a huge amount of the phenotypic variance, it still was able to tease apart these differences. So what were some of the main uh, causative mutation main learnings? Uh, the, the thousand bull resource really has accelerated the discovery of causative mutations. This is now uh, in many ways, it's not easy, certainly it's still not easy, but it's, it's definitely faster to, uh, to narrow down the set of candidates with some sort of filtering strategy using the resource, both at the micro level, when I, and by micro, I mean sort of monogenic versus macro, where I mean uh, basically enriching a set of SNPs for more, uh, more SNPs that might be causal. Many of these monogenic mutations now are routinely genotyped, and uh, this really leads to better management of carrier to carrier matings. So it's a very, very real impact of the Thousand Bulls project to have, um, you know, enabled at least in part that. And um, of course, we do know now that not all causative mutations are in the short breed sequence. Uh, there are some limit limitations and the limitations, one of the major ones is of course for structural variants. Um, you know, the short read data has, is not particularly good for finding structural variants. Just a short word on integration of different data sets. One very pragmatic thing is that if you have two SNP chips, let's say that are, uh, you know, you don't have any overlap on, well, what you can do is actually you can impute upwards into some sort of, in, into whole genome sequence. And then, you know, then you will have overlap uh, and, you know, so it actually allows you to integrate different marker platforms. Um, in dairy cattle, we don't tend to have that problem because we've coordinated reasonably well, but on the plant side, you know, thinking about plants, it's completely different, but uh, whole genome sequencing plants actually makes a big difference here to uh, make, sh make sure we can integrate different marker platforms. Um, the other thing that the Whole genome sequence and maybe the thousand bulls has sort of enabled this to combine GWAS results and with different types of functional data much more easily. Because if your GWAS is at the sequence level and your type of functional information is also at the sequence variant level, then you know we can much e more easily integrate these data sets and, and get away from the ambiguity of inferring LD all the time. So just as an example, uh, it's a bit busy, but this is uh, our gene expression sort of type data sets that we've collected over time at Agriculture Victoria. Uh, this is uh, 400 animals with white blood cells, uh, 300 animals with uh, milk cells, and then liver cells and muscle cells, doing RNA sequencing on them, align them to the same reference genome that we used for the thousand bulls. Um, and then we derive these um, uh, these uh, basically molecular phenotypes, uh, so gene counts, exon counts, intron counts, and allele counts. And 
by then putting that together with the thousand bulls project uh, output, which essentially is computed sequence uh, here, uh, we can then test all the SNPs that are you know, near these molecular phenotypes, near those genes or exons, and we can get expression QTL, uh, splice QTL, or allele-specific expression QTL, and you know, get a whole bunch of information on regulatory uh, activity potentially of uh, in, 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 the, in the space around genes. And essentially having this resource here uh, allows us not having to worry, uh, we can get a, not having to worry so much about LD and we can do that directly at the sequence variant level. And then of course, you know, back again to this paper here, um, you know, out of the 163 lead loci, 10 of them actually were EQTL, where one of them uh, um, was pretty, you know, seemed to be a pretty uh, important one. On to genomic predictions. Um, I guess early on, when people started looking at genomic prediction with whole genome sequence, there were some negative results, as in it didn't increase the accuracy of prediction. And by and large, they were because people used all sequence variants um, in those analyses. And generally, it tended to be when people looked within breed only. <clears throat> so all the individuals were very related. Um, now, of course, we didn't know that this wasn't going to work when you used all the sequence variants. So it's not, that's just, uh, I guess, a, a learning uh, from, from, from what we thought was the hypothesis. Because the hypothesis didn't really specify whether you used all of them or whether you had to prioritize them. But it did become clear pretty, pretty quickly, I suppose, that uh, some sort of um, prioritization of sequence variants was needed to actually get the benefit for genomic prediction. And we can do that with statistical ways, uh, GWAS or BASE-R or various other ways, maybe machine learning. Um, and we can look at functional ways, uh, you know, expression studies, EQTL, uh, epigenomics, or chipset peaks. In general, this is best done in conjunction with multi-breed designs to improve the fine mapping. But again, this is actually an, just another variant of causal variant discovery. So what we want to find here is a, is a large number of potentially uh, putative uh, near causal variants and then use them for genomic predictions. We're not so much worried whether each one is, is absolutely true, but by and large, we just want to enrich the set for variants that do something over variants that do not. So this is really the strategy we've pursued. So we, um, here we, the schematic here. So we have um, different uh, SNP chip markers uh, in, in the blue triangles, and we have the, the QTL or causative mutations in, in the red stripes here. And here we have the standard chip, SNP chip, um, and essentially these uh, blue triangles are neutral markers evenly spaced, as I said before. Now, our idea was to get to a custom 50K SNP chip where we get much closer with our markers to these uh, QTL. And, um, and that's the idea. And essentially, this would increase the precision of our QTL uh, effect estimates or our uh, marker effect estimates by being closer, less reliance on LD. Or, <clears throat> and then this would increase uh, our um, accuracy of prediction. So um, this is uh, the strategy we pursued. And I guess I should say, I'm going to talk about what we did. There's lots of other people that did things uh, to uh, prioritize variants. There's other papers, of course, um, and uh, others have demonstrated also that they could find an increase in uh, the uh, genomic prediction accuracy. So, but for our strategy, we combined 30 different sources of multi-omic information. So we had the expression QTL, we had the chipsec, um, of course, functional annotations were available and we, had, we did some selection signatures. Um, and we defined what uh, Ray Dong Xiang, who did this work, uh, what he calls uh, a faith score, which is a functional and 
evolutionary trait heritability. Um, and basically it's a ranking that uh, he, he has these 30 different sets. And for each of these sets, he works out uh, what proportion of the phenotypic variance uh, each of these markers in each set explains. And then uh, he aggregates that information across uh, uh, all the different 30 sources and uh, then comes up with a ranking for each variant according to this FAITH score. Um, so that's basically what that is. Um, and then there's additional work that was done to sort of further narrow down the set of markers. So the initial FAITH score and um, the prioritization based on pleiotropic clusters got us down to about 165,000 variants. This was still too much to put on a SNP chip. Uh, we needed to be, you know, below 50,000. Um, then they um, they looked at doing the, the uh, local genomic breeding values um, and uh, looked at uh, pleiotropic QTL per segment. Uh, further narrowed it down by just choosing one of the variants within these segments. Got it down to about 83,000 variants, um, and then. Basically, we looked at the design scores from Illumina SNP chips to get it down to about 40,000 or so variants to put on a new XT50K SNP chip. That's the final content here. So we had about 45,000 SNPs, uh, 1,200 or so indels, uh, 18,000 were within genes, uh, as in not intergenic, um, 14,000 were regulatory, uh, 20 or sorry, 2000 were evolutionary. So they were conserved across different, uh, 100 different species. And most of them were significant uh, in, in the multi-trait sort of GWAS analysis. Um, and uh, most of them were significant or were higher than 0.9 posterior probability of affecting multiple traits. And quite a few were actually very low math. Um, so we did take a bit of a risk there. We validated this in a multi-breed reference population um, with Holstein, Jersey, and Aussie Reds. We looked at standard 50K, XT 50K, and combined, and then validated it to Holstein, Jersey, and the crosses for the production traits. So the the XT50K, so the new custom array is in yellow. In gray, we have the standard, and in black is the combined XT plus the standard together. So in Holstein, Jersey, and, and uh, the crosses, it's clear that the XT50K has an advantage over the standard 50K. So it be, it's clear that we made an improvement in prediction accuracy by choosing uh, sequence variants in this way. We did another round of variant prioritization um, where we did, we chose 600 sequence variants, uh, including the existing XT50K plus um, whether they were um, uh, expression QTL, uh, but usually we needed to have two conditions. They were expression QTL, but also were in chipset peaks. Um, we chose SNPs that affected 19 polar lipid traits. And we also looked at conserved sites and, of course, uh, protein coding. And then we tested this in, we further prioritized this in, a, in our new block based multi trade base R. Uh, we ran a multi trade with 35 different dairy traits. Um, in bulls and cows separately and estimated the probability that a SNP is associated with at least one uh, of these analyzed traits. So we validated this again. So we uh, looked at, uh, we had a, two references. One was the Holstein reference and one was just the Jersey reference. Um, these are the numbers of animals. We had two different types of markers. One was standard plus custom. And then one was standard plus custom plus this set two. So what we're looking at here is really, is this new round of prioritization, does this again give us something more than we didn't have before? 
and we validated this into New Zealand cows. So in this set two, there were about four and a half thousand or so SNPs. So here, what we're looking at is just the diff so that we have the different validation sets here. And this is just, just the difference in uh, imputation, sorry, uh, genomic prediction accuracy over, over this set here. So basically what we're saying is um, we can incrementally make gains, gains by improving our SNP set. You know, we have, we've had one iteration of the XD50K. This set two is going to get us another gain. But, you know, there's no reason not to believe what, with more functional data and more information, we can't do better going forward. So I guess the main learnings from, from this piece here is that uh, using all sequence variants directly in prediction uh, has, of course, not been useful. And some sort of variant prioritization is required. When we're doing statistical priority, and I haven't talked about it very much, this very much, um, people need to be very careful in separating discovery and validation because they're going to get biased results if they don't do that. But uh, functional information we find very useful in, in prioritizing uh, variants. Um, we tend to need scenarios where we have diverse training populations and validation sets with limited relationships uh, to the reference to demonstrate the increase in accuracy because if we, everything's highly related, you're not going to see a difference between the different scenarios. But that doesn't mean you're not going to see it in application when you're going across generations and your LD starts breaking down. So we need multi-breed designs and um, we haven't demonstrated that there's an increase in accuracy from sequence variants. So where to from here, I guess, uh, for the project, the organization of the next phase is still to be decided, so discussions are ongoing. Potentially, we might move to the cloud uh, because that could potentially uh, make for easier collaborations. What should the data sharing model be? Should it stay a semi-public model that we have currently, or should it be fully public? Um, what should the reference genomes be? Should we go to some sort of pan genome? And what about using long read sequence as well? So I'll. This is the, my last slide. Um, the project has really accelerated the use of sequence data in cattle genetics. And it definitely, we have more effective near causative loci discovery for both monogenic and quantitative loci. We have demonstrated an increase in prediction accuracy. Um, and there are really many things we know now that we didn't 10 years ago. And I think in part we know these things because we've had the Thousand Bull Genomes project. Many, many people to thank. Um, Christy and Amanda who have been uh, instrumental in, in making the Thousand Bulls project work. Ben Hayes for getting it started and uh, Bob Schnabel for helping us with a lot of the data processing. With that, I leave it open for questions and I'm happy to stay a little bit after the hour, of course, uh, as, as uh, Gregory indicated. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, I invite everybody to, to either type their questions or um, you know just um, speak them speak them by microphone. Hans, I'll start with mine. Um, when you mentioned the mitochondrial DNA, you mentioned heteroplasmy, and you mentioned it's particularly high in bull semen. Is it much higher than in other tissues or you know their products? It's it's quite a bit higher. The reason is that in bull semen, you don't really have a lot of mitochondria. Um, so when we're sequencing from bull semen, then the coverage for at the mitochondrial level for semen tissues is it tends to be low. Um, now, the the main issue is actually that there's the the nuclear mitochondrial sequences that mess it up a bit. So they tend to then align. There's always a little bit of alignment of them to the mitochondrial genome. And when you have low um, low coverage of mitochondria from semen, then they tend to outweigh the actual real mitochondrial sequences. That then that leads to heteroplasmy. So we have to filter very heavily on it. Okay, so you're mostly removing the so-called NUMs, if I understand. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, it's an attempt to be, there's, it's actually very difficult to conclusively remove them. Um, but we can filter for it and the results we were getting made sense. So I guess that's our rationale. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Gabriela Fortuna is asking, is there any strategy in place to increase the number of Indicus data, also South American animals? Um, short answer is no. Um, it really, that really depends on who comes, uh, comes and joins the project. Um, we've, we've had discussions with uh, people from South America, um, but so far they haven't really joined. Uh, but, you know, everybody's welcome uh, to join. Um, there's a question from Ivan. Thanks for a very nice talk. Question one, you showed functional mutations, mutations on a custom chip, A. Why do you need to settle for 50K? Uh, B, would this chip actually need to be constructed for each breed separately? For example, w will it work for Indicus animals? And C, that's, that's a long question, how do you assure it's not too specific in regards to traits? Yeah, so, okay, what was A again? So um, A was- uh, Why did you buy, buy 50K? 50K. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we, we ran out of money basically is, is the answer, but uh, you know, it really, that's, that, that equation changes all the time. So, um, you know, that's really a function of um, what's the, the number of samples you have and uh, what's the pricing structure that Illumina and others uh, thermos, thermo do, uh, sort of uh, offer you, I suppose, right? So at the time, that was the most cost-effective solution. Um, so that's why we limited ourselves. Now, in terms of uh, should it be breed specific? Actually, it's no. That's that's actually a categorical no because uh, my my theory there or our theory is that we should be multi-breed. Uh, so you know to to be able to properly fine map during doing GWAS, and then you're actually much closer to the mutation, um, and then that's uh, it will actually work better across breeds if you do that. So. And then the third one, what was the third one, sorry? Um, how do you um, ensure that it's not gonna to be too trade specific? Uh, radio, so um, yeah, so I guess we, we, we just used uh, basically all the traits um, and just did a massive uh, uh, sort of uh, meta G was for multiple traits. And, and you know, there's still gonna be an issue with production traits carrying more weights because they have more power and things like that. So um, yeah, I guess that's potentially a worry. Um, in our first round, we didn't really have an issue with it. We, we still had in, probably bigger increases for fertility and health than we did for production. So it didn't seem to affect it that much. But I'm not saying it's not an issue at all. So it's something that needs to be thought about. Also breed composition in your prioritization strategy in the multi-breed population is something to think about. Perfect, lots of questions lined up, which is great. Pam is asking, um, she's wondering about what you have learned about accuracy in imputation and prediction for the rarer haplotypes in the data, especially say indices in animals. Are you better to use targeted reference population? You know, that the one that's more in indicing based. So I have to admit, I haven't really looked at Indocene versus um, Taurus myself. Um, so within Taurus, um, it's that uh, the, the best population is always gonna be the one that's, you know, best representation of, of your, your animals you want to impute into. So now the second best one is the one you can get. Um, and so, so <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's, I guess, where the thousand bulls shine. So, so it really enables the in, people to, you know, still get, get on with the job, even though some things might be a little bit imperfect. So this is a bit of a wishy-washy answer. I don't really have a good answer about the Indicus component, sorry. Thank you. Moving to Albert, my stock, talk hands. How transferable are the improvement in predictions that use functional information to other countries? 
I imagine most of the functional data was generated in Australian animals. Um, yeah, so the, the functional uh, data, yeah, the majority was done by us. We, in that second round, we did actually use, um, we did, we did use FANG data, so we did use the, the chipsec from, um, from the, the current lab um, or from that current paper. Um, we actually find it's reasonably uh, useful to predict it across countries. So, you know, we've, a lot of our validations have been into New Zealand, for example. So we have, you know, we, we prioritized in, in Australian populations and then predicted into New Zealand populations. Now that's still the same production system in a way. So it's all sort of grass, grassland based. Uh, but uh, then we, there was a validation in that uh, PNAS paper. There's a validation into the Danish population, um, and that seemed to work as well. So, um, so it it actually tends to work reasonably well across different countries. There's a there's actually in that uh, chip paper. I haven't mentioned it, but we actually used uh, U.S. Uh, GWAS results. Uh, the subset of it that was on the standard 50k and our XT um, to validate into Australia and also into New Zealand. And again, the XT chip did better than the standard. So I think for functional data, I'm not so sure it matters that much where it's from. Um, I think that's, you know, it, it tends to be useful wherever. It, it's also not that much of it. So any, any bit of it is, is good, I suppose. Thank you. Kelly Watson is asking, are the gains really meaningful with the addition of high heat variants? The gains seem to seem marginal and similar to Bayesian alphabet model comparison gains. Uh, I think she's referring to genomic prediction. Right. So um, I think they are meaningful because um, well, any increase is meaningful. You know, it, now there's of course a cost to the functional data, there's a cost to people coming out with methods of prioritization and, and you know, they all need to be paid. But, <clears throat> you know, I've looked at lots of different models and, you know, they go, you know, there's might be a difference of 2% or something like that. There's not actually a huge difference in many of the models, the genomic prediction models for majority of the traits we actually look at. So these are in the range of that. Uh, and I've, I guess my point today is that multiple successive rounds of it uh, would lead to multiple successive increases in genomic prediction accuracy. Now, the, the gains are higher actually when you go into, um, so when you go into go, predicting across generations or predicting into really less related individuals, the gains are actually a little bit higher than that still. Um, and actually, in some sense, the question is, um, well, what are you giving up by not doing it? Because uh, the drop in accuracy of genomic prediction across generations is actually reasonably substantial. So anything you don't give up there by going closer to the causative mutations uh, could actually be you know, quite useful for breeding programs, especially as they start pushing uh, their generation in tools really heavily. Thanks for the answer. Um... And if I add to this, so if I recall from your slide where you showed the bar chart with the genomic prediction, I believe that sort of, you know, the, the top value you were getting is sort of 0.5. So, you know, we're kind of still missing a lot of genetic variation, even with the whole genome sequence data across many animals. I'm looking now, I actually see it's R. So is this, is this correlation or is reliability? That's correlation. Now, like a lot of these, validations we you know they're across country and there's you know it's more the difference between the methods that i would be looking at here rather than absolute level i mean i know new zealand has higher accuracies of you know in their routine evaluations than this as well and then and so does australia but uh yeah no the point taken uh you know the general level certainly for crossbreds and jerseys is is certainly you know not super high is it <clears throat> So does the consortium have any hypothesis? You know, how do we go beyond, you know, whatever value that is? There seems to be, there's still quite a lot to be gained. You know, is it non-additive genetics? Is it, you know, what are we missing? Yeah, good question. 
Donc, um, I think to me, it's a bit what you what what what's the question you want to look at? Um, there might be some non-additive things going on, of course, um, but when you Again, I, I wouldn't really get too hung up on the level here because that's basically just a matter of data set size um, and you know what's the relationship of the validation to the reference and all these sort of things. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess the consortium consortium is, is basically more about creating a resource than it is about uh, you know answering some of those questions. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't actually have a good answer for that. Yeah. No, I know it's an open-end question. We we are kind of seeing the same results, you know, with the similar types of data we're working with uh, with here. Um, you know, I'm just yeah trying to pick your brain a little bit. And Kelly is sort of expanding on her question. You know, could the addition of high heat variants be perhaps more important if you're looking in a situation with greater potential for G by E? Um, G by E, um, uh, potentially, um, I think it might be, I think it's more of a function of the diversity of populations and things, um, and that, that, you know, when it's, it's an interaction a little bit of, of three different things. Um, one is, um, uh, the method used to do genomic prediction. Um, one is how diverse is your training population and how diverse and how is it related to the validation um, or what you're trying to predict into. Um, and so well, that's two main things really. So um, so if you have, um, if you're trying to prioritize variance or try to estimate precise effects in, a, in within a breed and uh, everything is highly related, you're going to have your marker effects smeared with a G block, for example, or something, or even with a Bayesian, everything is going to be smeared across the whole genome, and and you know, there's not, you know, you're not going to be be particularly precise. But if you do that in the multi-breed population, um, where your LD is, is is a little bit less, then you and you do that maybe with a Bayesian potentially than a, than a G block, then your your marker effect estimates might be a bit better, um, and then well then that does transfer better into different populations. Um, and that holds up better across uh, generations as well. Now, whether that has a lot to do with E, uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. Yeah, um, yeah. Disentangling G by E is gonna be really, really hard. It's, we don't really have the, you know, the same genotype in different environments in cattle, or in some cases we do, but mm -hmm. yeah, it, we're still quite limited on that set, set on, you know, on that front. Yeah. 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 I am not seeing any questions. Um, and I think we've extended a little bit, so I would, you know, close the, the talk once again, thanks Hans, but if anyone